welcome everybody to From the Set. We're back on the set this time here at From the Logo. Today we're going to talk about the Blazers and then we're going to talk a little bit about the end of the season, the MVP race, and where the playoff seedings are shaking out. So we're going to start off with the Blazers beating the Timberwolves in what might be the most embarrassing loss in NBA history. <laughs> Shade and Sharp taking over down the stretch, making Gobert and Cat his bitch at the rim. Beautiful to see. What did you guys think about that? Biggest upset in Vegas odds, in modern Vegas odds history for the NBA. Uh, Blazers went in as 19 and a half point underdogs. Uh, so if you took the underdogs on this one, good for you, but I certainly didn't. We had the legendary G. Nathan <laughs> Nathan? Williams playing minutes in the, in the fourth quarter against the whole Timberwolves starting lineup, including Gobert. Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns. That's three all-stars for those of you keeping count at home. And we had G. Nathan into the game, and we somehow won the game. Obviously, this was all on the back of one shade and sharp. But, you know, some other guys were helping out there, too, in ways that I didn't think they could. So that was a crazy game to watch. I cannot believe they won. You know what's crazy? Our friend of the show, AJ Lucero, won $26 on that game. Wow. He bet off $2. He texted me the other <laughs> day. Him. He somehow picked the Blazers. I was like, how the hell did you pick that one, dude? You freaking Just imagine, Nostradamus. Imagine here. if he'd bet $26. <laughs> would have been a good Be day. a millionaire at this point. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun to watch. It's probably the most fun I've had watching a Blazer game since Dame 71, yeah. I would say. Agreed. It was it was a blast. And what was funny was even our own announcers, you know, Kev and Lamar, I mean, they're, they do such, they work so hard to stay positive during a tank. But even <laughs> they, the whole game, they were just like, you know, waiting for the, for the, minnesota to make a run they were just like and the blazers are keeping it close like who would have thought they'd have it within 10 you know all night long and then when it started to get to the end into crunch time and it was like wow i think minnesota might actually be a little nervous right now and then eventually it was like the game was almost out of hand and there were only a few seconds left and we were up four points or whatever and yeah it was uh not expected even by the guys traveling with the team. I did love to hear uh, uh, Calabro's like calls where he's like knocks at the rim. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good impression. <laughs> you like that? So, yeah, they had so many fun plays too. Like there was a lot of runouts and like lobs and that sort of thing. It was they actually played. It was like fun to watch them play. They didn't look like a bunch of scrubs or anything. They looked like there was some. There might be some actual diamonds in the rough potentially on this team. Or yeah. is it Chauncey's coaching? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. You you throw in. Oh, uh, you're throwing. We've shade. lost. You're throwing shade. <laughs> We've lost the last like four games by like an average of. I I actually points. watched the highlights of it, uh, and it was the Timberwolves announcers. So it was fun to listen to the other side of it too, as they just got like more and more, like more <laughs> yeah, basically <laughs> starting to get panicked with this. And my favorite part was when uh, Ant Man. Anthony Edwards stole the ball in the backcourt from Shaden and dunked it. And then he ran up and he was like laughing at Shaden and Chauncey. And I knew in the back of my head, the Blazers were going to win the game. I was like, oh, that's fantastic. That's some like Dame Lillard level sass for him to go out and win that game after getting taunted like yeah, that. Yeah, he's like, oh, this is not going over well for me. Trust me, man. I... Being a strong supporter of the NBA, but also not wanting to pay money, I decided to watch this game through less than, you know, well, kosher, kosher means sailing the seas. Captain Are Jack you Johnny Sparrow. Depp? And it was hilarious because I had the Wolves announcers the entire game. That I watched really intensively in the fourth quarter, obviously. And as Shaden Sharp hit a crazy hanging layup, he, he waved off Anthony Edwards. Yeah. and then he, You mean Eubanks? Or uh, yeah, well he he was he was Anthony Edwards was guarding Sharp and Eubanks came up to set a screen. He waved off Eubanks because he wanted to ISO on Anthony Edwards, drove past him and finished over Gobert. The Wolves announcers were like, "Wow, what a move!" <laughs> they were shocked. And the funniest part about the whole game 
was when the Wolves tried to go down and tie the game and Kyle Anderson oh. had his legendary shocking the fool <laughs> moment, which will be remembered for history, all of history. That might have been the ugliest thing I've ever seen in the dying moments of a game. That was... <laughs> How do you miss the backboard with a layup? You miss the backboard with a layup in the crunch time. One more thing about those announcers. Like, about uh, right after halftime, they were saying something along the lines of, like, and the Timberwolves want to get this over with fast so they can rest their starters, and they just haven't been able to shake this Blazers team yet. And Again, I knew that they were going to lose. It was very satisfying from that perspective. My favorite thing about the game is that that was a must-win game for Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, they're fighting. They have their whole team. They're fighting for a play-in spot. Yeah, and, you know, Nate, our boy Nate, was out G- there. Just, G. Nathan. Just killing them, killing their multiple all-stars and title hopes. <laughs> Maze, too. That dude was hitting floaters all game long. Yeah. He really chipped in. And uh, um, Watford, for that matter, with the floater game. So that's kind of like the big question. As I was watching the game, it, you know, it kept crossing my mind like, okay, maybe just like two or three of these guys are really going to be on the team next year or are, have been part of our long-term plan. But did you see, have you seen anyone else the last few games? Shout out Drew Eubanks real quick though. I mean, that guy was flying all over the court blocking shots. He's the heart of the team right now really on is, this particular yeah. team. On I, defense I'd really like to keep him if we can. If we can. I mean, I understand, understand he's an undersized center and he presents some liabilities but i really like his what he brings to the team as far as like an emotional standpoint and sort of an energetic standpoint i think that he could contribute on a winning team you know coming off the bench playing that role he's definitely passionate and he plays with a lot of energy and he's a spark plug and it's kind of nice coming from nurkic who kind of yeah, lumbers slouches through down. everything and yeah. you can say what you want about his talent or when he plays well but he always kind of plays with this kind of pace mm-hmm. and it's like okay and then boom, eubanks boom, comes boom, in and he's boom. like all right ready to go <laughs> right and he kind of picks the whole team up and gives you some energy so yeah. i can i can agree with that i would still like to bring in a full backup center that's seven foot and you know lock down defense if you can but eubanks has definitely provided the spark I think that Maze has been interesting. He looks like a piece. He looks he, like he could be a piece. He's a, kind of a bigger guard. He passes well. He doesn't get out of control. He's got the floater game down. Floater game down. He hit a clutch layup, a spinning layup. Yeah, that was a bear. nice move. He's hit threes. You know, he he's kind of just an all around player. And we've been bamboozled before by guys playing well during a tank. So it's something. To Brandon take note Williams. Of. I was never bamboozled by that. <laughs> I was right on the money on Brandon Williams. He was a child. Fair, fair. But this guy looks, he plays within the offense, and that's what the Blazers have needed, another playmaker. We've said it all year. They need a guy that can set the table for the other guys. And it was so serious for us of a problem that we got Ryan Archie Diacono in the game, and we were like, wow, finally we have a point guard. <laughs> No, Maze looks way better than Ryan yeah. did, and you can and just Keon see, for that matter. Oh my gosh, Ke- Keon's a shooting guard. Keon should not it's be true. a point guard. It's He's true. not a ball handler. He's a play finisher, just like we talk about with Sharp. Although Sharp has be- been becoming a playmaker in these last, we'll few talk games. about him here in a minute. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so Maze has been something to look at, and then Knox. Knox yeah, has provided that's, a spark. that's who I was going to mention. I yeah, don't take it away. I don't hate Knox. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, one thing about Knox is that he. What's he listed at? Like six, 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 seven, something six, like seven, that. Seven, I think. But he looks taller than that. He's he is long, he and like even when he's at the free throw line and like extends up, that's like a seven foot looking guy shooting that shot. And when he plays defense, he looks like he's more like six ten sometimes. So yeah, I think that he has a lot of potential. It's like you said, we've been bamboozled before. It, we're probably not going to hit on multiple guys. It's unlikely that Mays is going to be the backup point guard of the future, and Knox is going to be like this incredible six seven piece out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, maybe one or the other. I kind of like to give him a shot. The yeah, the thing with Knox is that he kind of seems like one of those players that plays well with lots of reps. You know, like the more if he gets lots of minutes and lots of shots, then sometimes he can go off for a game but he doesn't really strike me as the type of piece that's like gonna be able to come off the bench in limited minutes and be really effective i don't know maybe he'll prove me wrong but it just doesn't necessarily i think with Mays, like you said he plays more in the offense he kind of seems like the type that maybe could do that could come off the bench and play limited minutes and like be at least hold down the fort for a while like not hemorrhage points like has been the issue every time damon comes off the court for the last 
I don't even know how many years at this point. Hopefully, Knox or Maze will be on the team next year playing one of those role player roles. But uh, also, we have that Knicks pick, you know, and so hopefully we'll be able to get another quality rookie to maybe also come off the bench and, uh, you know, fill out that the uh, bench as well. Yeah, so there's a couple ways the Blazers could go here, and it really depends on what happens with the other first round pick and their whole plan. So I think we would all argue that the key is to get, unless you're going to tank or, you know, rebuild and trade Dame, we want to get Dame more talent. The one thing holding up getting, you know, trading away future picks is that Chicago obligations that we have to pay. If Chicago will take this pick, which is currently slotted at the 23rd slot in the draft, I would argue you just send them the Knicks pick. So that way you can trade all your future first round picks and get help for Dame. However, if for some reason you trade your lottery pick, you know, if it's not like the top pick or something or the top three picks, and you want to get Dame help, you trade your lottery pick and someone like Ant, then you might want to take you know that 23rd pick and pick up a cheap rookie. If you're looking at the 23rd pick and you're looking at actual players, I would argue that a big man in that range is really key because early on there's a lot of wings and stuff and you know guards always lurk in there. Bigs have kind of started to drop in value, but we still need bigs we need young athletic bigs Nurkic Nurkic averages about 38 games a season and that's not an exaggeration (laughs) in the last five seasons that's what he's averaged per season 38 games if we keep the pick I want them to take a big if we trade it to Chicago I think that's probably the best move if Chicago will accept maybe throw in some of those GP2 second rounders that we got just to sweeten the deal for them and then we can just move on from that trade that got us Larry Nance and just hasn't really worked out we can trade future picks after that and get help now. That's what I want them to do with it. Where do you think the line is for, obviously we have to wait until after the lottery to see what the Blazers number one pick is or, you know, first round pick is, but if we're not in the top five, if we're not in the top four, like where does it become a trade piece rather than, you know, drafting for help? It might depend on who who's on the board, and yeah. it might be like a last minute decision. And it also and what might, you can get for them, what's on the market, exactly who's on the market. So there's guys out there. Someone like Cat might be on the market. You want to know why? Because and he just lost to the Blazers and took three shots <laughs> over Eubanks. Over <laughs> Eubanks, one for three against Eubanks. He had right? he had eight points, nine boards. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know. I would. Not trade a pick that's in the top four for Cat. I would trade for Cat. I would. And it depends on the value that you're you're looking at here because, you know, he's not like my dream acquisition because let's be honest, he's not a lockdown defender, okay? Mm-hmm. But people are kind of starting to underrate the guy. You know, he's a second – he's twice been on the all-NBA teams. And might be able to get him for a steal at this point. His value might be low, and if you wonder why – well, he's been hurt all year, but it's kind of been a minor injury, okay? It was a scary injury, though. Yeah, but it, it wasn't looked, like a... It looked like an Achilles tear when it happened, because he felt... Right. He thought that he had been, like, kicked from behind. It was that classic, like, what hit me? Yeah. And he was, like, looking behind him. But he wasn't... Like, it wasn't like a torn ACL no. or, like, a torn Achilles or leg issues that are going to, you know, take a long time to heal. So, all I'm saying is... Cat might be on the move just because they need to recoup some of the value they lost in the Rudy Gobert trade. That was an awful trade for them. It doesn't look like it's working out as they fall out of playoff contention. Exactly. <laughs> and and they're still Kat's, clinging on like, by their fingernails. <laughs> they're both centers, Cat and Rudy. So somebody's got to go. Rudy's probably not going to get all that value back. Mm-hmm. So the Blazers need to try and look around and try and get a center upgrade. Cat might be available. If, if they don't you know make the playoffs or flame out. So I would make the trade just to balance the roster. Mm-hmm. I want Shaden Sharp to start at shooting guard next year, no matter what. I think you guys agree with me. It's the question. Has he earned it this season? The answer is yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. And yeah, we can if, he, start if, he's not, if he's not starting next year, there's a huge problem with coaching or management. or the, That needs to be addressed if he's not starting next year. It's pretty obvious at this point, Simons has got to go, and the backcourt of the future has to be Lillard and Shaden Sharp. Yeah, and we can dive into Shaden's game against the Timberwolves in a second, and I just think that 
if the Timberwolves were to will take something like Anthony Simons, which is gives them the all ant backcourt, and they take you know Nurkic to complete the salary, and then maybe if we open up some future picks and trade him maybe two firsts, right? Mm-hmm. Then you got Cat in there, and then Shaden can move it and start. That's what we all want. I mean, Shaden was amazing in the Timberwolves game, and he's been really amazing in all these games. Yeah, I've thought for a long time that I'd love to pair Dame with Cat. And now I had that thought originally about five years ago, maybe even six years ago. And, you know, Cat has seemingly taken a step back since then. Um, but he still has just an insane amount of, of ability and talent. And honestly, maybe playing with, with Dame and some younger guys would take a little bit of pressure off of him in a way. Um, and maybe honestly, even just a change of scenery. You know, he's kind of had a lot of ups and downs with the Timberwolves. I think there's a conflict brewing between him and Anthony Edwards, yep. too. It's that classic Aldridge, yep. Damian Lillard conflict of the young kid coming into town, clearly more talented, clearly the style fits the modern NBA more. They're clearly going to go with him, you know, over Cat as their star of the future. And I don't know if Cat necessarily really digs it. I think he kind of has shown there's been signs that he, I don't know that he doesn't like Anthony Edwards, but I think he might feel a little bit disrespected maybe that, you know, this young kid's come in and pretty much taken the helm of the team so quickly. There was that classic moment, earlier this year or last year where he was like uh admonishing anthony edwards for eating chicken or something like that he was like yeah i need to get his diet cleaned up it was kind of an awkward moment kind of so, a little dig at someone who's yeah i think there's obviously some obviously fine <laughs> yeah i think there's some tension between them and i think that maybe if he went to a team where he wasn't like or that he wasn't the franchise guy before you know he's coming to, if he came to portland and he's does has kind of has that weight off his shoulders. He doesn't have to be the franchise guy. There's a established franchise guy there, and he can just play his game. It might be a good fit. I don't know if the Timberwolves are going to make that move, though. I mean, they are clearly in win now mode. They went all in. It didn't necessarily work, but giving up like a piece like Cat isn't going to make your team better necessarily, unless you get a huge haul for it back. Simons is, you know, he's a decent player, but. That'd be a tough move for the uh, Timberwolves. I don't know if they're necessarily going to go that route. I think the all-ant backcourt probably could have some potential for Minnesota. I think that um, totally. you know it's something that they'd have to figure out, just as a lot of teams do when they bring in a second guard and try to go with you know a two-star guard lineup. But they'd have Gobert, hopefully, to kind of anchor the defense. I don't know. It didn't really work against the Blazers G League <laughs> squad. But... Yeah, Shaden finishing over him every time he had an opportunity. But, I mean, I can see them potentially making the move and giving it a try. I mean, a lot of teams are tempted by that. Whether they should be or not, they are. And if things aren't working real well with, with Cat, I think it's a possibility. Um, but I also, from the Blazers' perspective, I don't want to give up too much for him. I think that if we could find a way to have like a – Dame, Shaden, Jeremy Grant, Cat, and then Victor Wimbenyama. Yeah, that or could I mean, happen. even even Thibel if it, if we didn't get something like that to st- to help with defense for a while until we figure it out whoever our our early picks going to be. But that would be a pretty solid team, but I don't want to give up so much for Cat that we have, you know, no flexibility. We could be forward. pairing Cat with another Tall Frenchman, the new <laughs> the new tallest Frenchman in the NBA. Yeah. So here's the thing, though. I agree that you know they might that they might be like, well, I don't know about Ant and Ant, but I think that they are a great fit together. Anthony Edwards is a great defender, and he's still I mean he's still young, but he's a big guard. Anthony Simons has played with Dame, another undersized guard. This way, Anthony can come in. He's a 6'4 guard, and he's playing next to a 6'7 guard. I think that takes a lot of pressure off him. Not He doesn't have to be a defender, you know, as much as he does on the Blazers. That helps a lot with that. Right now, the Timberwolves' structure of their team is not working. Cat is currently out of position at the five, at the 4, okay? And we a lot of people thought that going in, what are they doing getting Gobert and trying to play them both together? Mm-hmm. If we happen to get Victor Wimbanyama, he's about three times as mobile as Gobert and can play on the perimeter. So that would be a, actually an awesome pairing. And put back his own three with a dunk. <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's an alien. But I'm just saying the Timberwolves organization, their roster right now is not working out. 
right now, as is. And Cat might be the one to go. As a Blazers fan, we'll make it work. We'll make sure to fit it in there so that we get Cat and they get trash, right? <laughs> It's the classic. I don't think Simons is That's trash. The, I know. Just not the right fit. It's hyperbole, game. but I'm just saying. As a Blazers fan, like Blazers fans tend to do this. We oh, tend yeah. to be like, oh, we're gonna get Giannis. We're gonna get this player for. We're gonna figure out a way to jigsaw this together so that we have on uh, DeAndre Ayton and ten superstars around Damian Lillard. You say that, but it's like every other team in the NBA can trade for an all star every once in a while. Why can't we do it? We can't. We can't. We're I think we could Portland. It rains here too much, man. (laughs) Watch. This isn't the thing I'm speaking into existence now. First, it was the Kings making the Western Conference Finals. (laughs) Then it was Victor Wembanyama. This will be the season the Blazers make a big trade for somebody who was previously an all star. So we're gonna end up with Wembanyama and another all star. Oh yeah. I'm going all Colton's in. Colton's speaking it this into existence. This is an optimistic year. It's happening. Nostradamus. People. You watch. I'm not going to say it's Cat. I'm just saying somebody's going to come free. The Blazers are going to jump on it. They're going to send that Chicago pick, get it back. We're going to go all in and get Victor Wembanyama. <laughs> Season tickets I will purchase next year. So Cat, tall Frenchman. This is reminding me of Shade and Sharp's game against the Timberwolves. I feel like we need to talk about this a little bit more. Him just finishing over both of those guys. Oh. Beautiful moves at the rim. He had a couple moves where he switched hands midair, like Jordan-esque layups. He was finishing over, you know, some of the supposed best defensive players in the league. Oh, the slight to Rudy, huh? I don't know. I don't really... I'm not all in on Rudy. I don't think he's as good as advertised necessarily. He's just kind of one of those players that's sort of being phased out a little bit, you know? Can't shoot. Can't really handle. That's tough to play that way in today's NBA. But, yeah, Shaden had a move there at the end where he laid it up and was looking over at the ref for a foul call i was like that's a super that's a superstar (laughs) move right there that look over at the ref was a superstar look it was yeah really cool to watch what did he what did he have Riley? what was his stat line then 27 points six assists six rebounds that's basically what he's averaged since he's been starting right yeah and efficient shooting Mm -hmm. hits he's hitting a lot of threes he's getting to the rim you know, he's doing everything that a, a superstar three-level scorer can do. And he's still 19. He doesn't turn 20 until May. The it's season crazy. will be over. He's starting to make his free throws at a better clip, too. That was one thing I noticed. I think he's, for the season, like 60-some percent, which is not unusual for someone as young as him. Hasn't been able to develop a rhythm. Really. Yeah, yeah. but he went 7 for 9, which is, you know, pro- I guess probably similar to that. But he, toward the end of the game, hit like four clutch free throws in a row Mm -hmm. that looked pure and that's that's really what matters you know when you're talking about a guy developing like that is if he starts to be able to hit those with pressure i mean he's he his form and everything he has a 90 percent free throw stroke yeah and he's doing this he's six six it's a guard that can make these guard moves at six 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 seven that is so much different than what we're used to seeing a guy be i mean it was kind of shocking watching him finish over like Gobert and Cat. It's like I just haven't seen a Blazers guard be able to finish over you know defense at the rim in years. I mean Dame obviously he can do it, but it's because he's like a superhuman with that sort of stuff. And usually, let's be honest, Dame finishes through guys. Yeah, Shaden not over. finishes over guys, yeah. and that's not a slight on Dame. Better. They're they're just different sized guys. They have different skill sets and. I mean, I'll, I'll take Dame any day, but you know, Shaden's ability is just something that complements what Dame does really well. And honestly, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if Dame didn't have to put his body in that much jeopardy as often. Like when he goes to the rim that hard over and over and over, eventually that's going to catch up to him. Eventually he's going to get hurt more. I'm sure it contributed to some of his ab- abdominal issues. Potentially. And if, you know, he can get a little bit of help with those takes to the rim, that's only going to help lengthen his career as well. Yeah. I'm not I I don't dislike Anthony Simons. I think he's a good player. Just a bad fit. Just a bad fit with Damon. We've known Shaden, it for a while now. Exactly. Our first video was titled Can Damon Anthony Coexist? <laughs> and we that said was no. our first video. Check it out. We're not nearly as, you know, spiffy as we are now, but <laughs> But the the thing that Blazer fans have been cr- like screaming from the roost- rooftops for like three seasons now, 
We don't want to be undersized anymore. Mm-hmm. Shaden at the two going forward allows us to not be undersized. You have to make he the He has move. all this potential. I think if he was in this this upcoming draft, he'd be the second overall pick over Scoot. Mm-hmm. Like he was that highly regarded. If he would have played at Kentucky, the Blazers would not have been able to draft yeah. him, is my is my opinion. He's that good. He's gonna be that good going forward. He's already, you know, outpacing in you know what Simons was doing as a rookie. And he's close to what Simons is doing now, and Simons is 23 years old. So you have to make the move to start Shaden going forward. Did you already mention that his bucket there at the end, he has more points in the paint than I uh, haven't. Yeah, go ahead and say it. He, so this is a shout-out to Rip City Reddit. You know what shout I mean? Shout-out Rip City Reddit. You know, Shaq, Shaq Randolph, the poster, of course, got to give everybody credit, right? <laughs> so within five feet of the rim, Shaden has now passed – and Fernie Simons throughout the season for buckets within five feet in the rim. You know, Simons has played how many more minutes than Shaden, right? A ton. So, like, take five that times example. as many minutes yeah. or something. Yeah. Five minutes, 500 minutes less to be exact. Yeah. Shaden goes to the rim. He hits threes. He does everything we need. If he goes into the offseason and works on his handles and continues to improve on defense, What's the what's the flaw? He's got in the game? all the physical tools to be able to do both of those things too. Yeah, I don't totally. see anything, you know, holding him back from becoming a great on ball defender and a great ball handler. To be to be honest, there's really no excuse for not trying to yeah. move Anthony this off season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you almost you have to move one of them. And it would be pretty insane to move Shaden unless it's for just an all star player. I almost but. think it's like Anthony or Dame, not Anthony or Shaden. I, I is, don't think you can move Shaden at this point. Like it would just be such a unless it's like for Giannis or someone like that. I would trade Shaden for Embiid. Okay, if Embiid comes loose because Giannis isn't coming loose and becoming available to trade for, I would trade Simons and Sharp for Embiid. Yeah. And that's like kind of the list right there. Like that's how highly I think of Shaden. MB, the MVP. Yeah, or the potential MVP. We'll talk about that a little bit more later too. Yeah. But he's amazing, and uh, he's still 19. Don't trade him. I know, yeah. Like you said, no excuse to not trade uh, Simons at this point. Shaden must start next year. He must start. And I'll look forward to watching Anthony thrive somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, I will too. I'll root for the guy wherever he goes. You know, No hard feelings. You know it's going to happen. Simons will be starting next year, and we will be moaning about <laughs> it the whole season. Yeah. They invested a hundred million in the kid for a reason, I guess. But just prepare yourself. God, it's gonna be so annoying. I'm gonna be ranting and raving about that for all summer long <laughs> into the fall. Trust me. Is Shaden playing too good right now though? Is he jeopardizing our chances to get a good lottery pick? Is he jeopardizing our chances for Wimby? Is it time to shut him down? It it was worth it. To watch Minnesota fall <laughs> apart like that. I really want to see him play, <laughs> yeah. but it's starting to become like, man, we might need to <laughs> take more of these players off the table so that we can continue to lose. We've lost all of our other games recently by like 27 That's points. True. I think the Wolves were just that bad that <laughs> night. I think that really quick for the Spurs game that we play, Shaden might have to come down with an illness for one game. <laughs> yeah. And then we play him in the rest of the games. And maybe, you know... Middle of the game, Watford has the stomach flu if we're close. And we set him on the bench. A little gastrointestinal distress never (laughs) hurt anybody. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, yeah, we're coming down to the end of the season. And speaking about the rest of the league, the playoff seeding is still really close in the West. There's like four teams tied with 38 losses. Um, My favorite story over the last few weeks has been the complete implosion of the (laughs) Dallas Mavericks. Watching Kyrie Irving ruin yet another team, <laughs> just completely torpedo <laughs> at yet another another NBA franchise. Add another banner to his wall of teams <laughs> that he's destroyed. <laughs> yeah, that's I like. I mean, I'm I don't hate Luca. I'm not a Luca hater, but it, it's been fun to watch the Mavericks implode. I'm gonna be honest. I I usually don't. Okay, that's that's a lie. I do like to engage in that. What do they call it? Scheiden. Scheiden Freud. Yeah, Scheiden Freud. What uh, enjoyment of watching others suffer? I think is basically the definition of that. But I, I start to question Luca. I'm kind of starting to question him at this point. He's kind of been through a gauntlet of role players that are 
have worked out in places after they've left there. They've done better after they've left. And Riley's spoken about it many times before that his attitude, his sort of, uh, you know, body language and demeanor. <laughs> exactly. He slumps, man. Yeah, it's it's not really great for the chemistry of a team. And, you know, they've been through Porzingis. They've been through Brunson. Now Kyrie, I mean those two. That was wow. just a marriage made in hell, basically. I'm talking but about birds of a feather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that they're probably not going to make the playoffs at this point. I'm kind of thinking there. I never would have thought that out of all those teams when we were looking at those teams, who was going to be left out? I did not see it being the Mavericks. I thought that you know Western Conference Finals last year. I thought for sure they were a shoe in, but it's looking rough right now for the Mavericks. Yeah. So on February 10th. They had a 96% chance of making the playoffs. February 10th, when Luca was still having fun playing basketball. <laughs> yeah. Now that he's not having fun playing basketball and he's, you know, trying to figure out a way to get enough shots up with Kyrie taking, you know, half of the shots they just he used take to take. Turns at this point. Shots are being fired here. Too. They're down to <laughs> less than 8% chance of making the playoffs. Oof. 96 to 8, and all that they did during that time was add Kyrie Irving and stop having fun playing basketball. And they lost they yeah. lost some of their 3 and D guys, too, which I think hurt them. I mean, their defense was number 7th last year. This year, it's like number 23 or something mm-hmm. like that. So losing um, Dorian Finney-Smith really hurt them. I think losing Dinwiddie honestly hurt them. It hurt their depth and their you know scoring off the bench. Yeah, it's uh, rough for Dallas right now. Going into the season, we talked about we tried to rank the playoff teams. I had I was high on the Kings, but I'm not going to mention that again. For <laughs> what a while. I think you just did mention. Anyways, it. <laughs> so we talked about the Mavericks, right? I personally remember being not very high on their supporting cast, you and were? that was one of the reasons why I put them lower on my list. However, they've jettisoned their mediocre supporting cast, and now they have zero supporting <laughs> cast and they have Dwight Powell as their starting center, you know, and Tim Hardaway is like their he was a bench guy and now he has to start for him. Their team Reggie Bullock, is a like... shell and it has no defense, no interior presence, you know, not a lot of bench, not a lot of depth, just none of what they need really. None and of what they had last year. I thought that run. Yeah, and I thought that Kyrie could come in and at least, you know, give him a boost enough to outscore teams to but make the But you were wrong, and we were right. <laughs> <laughs> we called that one. They somehow didn't get a boost on offense, and then they're just awful on defense. It's because so. they're just two ISO players that take turns, basically. Yep. And they don't, not only do they take turns, like, possession for possession, they take turns, like, quarter for quarter. I guess uh, Luca is good in the first and the third, and Kyrie's good in the second and the fourth. And they also uh, take turns like game to game. I've noticed over the last two or three games, like Luca will have one where he has 40 plus and Kyrie's in that 20 point range. And then the next game, Kyrie has like 40 plus and Luca's in that 20 point range. They just haven't ha- figured out how to both, you know, go off for 35 each or whatever, which is basically what they're going to need to do with no defense and no supporting cast. And what's crazy, and this is true, 60 points is not enough points to win a game. <laughs> When you have no supporting cast, when the your supporting cast is putting together a total of, you know, 30 points and you're putting together 60. And you're giving up 140 a game. Exactly. They have no chance and they are not going to make the playoffs. They have a top 10 protected pick. They It's in their best interest to tank like one of our teams that we're, we're knowing, you know, <laughs> because they want to keep that pick and try and get some value and keep it. If they finish 11th... Where's that pick coming from? Uh, well, they traded it. I would think it was part of the Porzingis trade. I think so it's Washington. New York. Oh, New York. New York wants them to make the playoffs so they get the pick. Here's the funny thing. If Dallas ends up 11th, they not only miss the play-in, they don't get their pick. So I'm hoping that's what happens. Because that would be hilarious. Luka and Kyrie deserve that instance where they literally don't make the play-in tournament and don't get their first-round pick. Is Luka gone? Is he, I, I, one of them's gone, if not no, both. Kyrie's still going to get a, three teams offering him a yeah. max this summer somehow. He's becoming the new Westbrook know. where he's just like fleecing teams into thinking he's... <laughs> A franchise guy, but I, I man, mean, how many times does he have to prove that he's just going to torpedo your team if you 
pick him up. He tricked Mark Cuban, but I don't know how many more he's got in him. He I... tricked Mark Cuban again. <laughs> yeah, backed I mean, into a corner. Exactly. Kind of like the Blazers are with Jeremy Grant a little bit. I mean, not the same stuff along with uh, Torpedo in the franchise, but just the fact that they kind of have to pay him what he wants or else they lose him for nothing. It's a tough situation for a franchise to be in. But honestly, as far as like what you said with losing Luka... I don't know what the winning path is with Kyrie. Like, if you just let Kyrie go, you might lose Luka because you have no hope. But if you pay Kyrie and Luka realizes he's going to be stuck with him for three more years, he might be gone too. Sign and trade. That so, might be their way out yeah. to the Lakers or <laughs> some bum. Yeah, that's the thing. They probably It's probably going to hard, be hard for them to get the value back that they just gave away for him, which is just like a bench guy and a 3 and D guy. So, yeah, I... I uh, watched a YouTube video recently where they were talking about, it was kind of funny, they were talking about how none of the Euro guys have asked out, like Giannis resigned, Embiid's happy in Philly, Jokic resigned. basically all the top Euro guys have stayed with their franchises and Luka might be bucking that trend soon, he could be the first one to kind of ask out and be gone. And it's not confirmed that this is going to happen, but I could see it happening. Since I'm, since we're basically the NBA multiverse of podcasts, let's imagine a what if scenario. Could you see the Oklahoma City Thunder trading their treasure trove of first round picks to Dallas and acquiring Luca, and then having SGA and Luca? I don't think a foul would be called against any other team ever again. But that's worrisome because I could see that Oklahoma City Thunder team being the ones to acquire Luca. They have a ton of assets. They can go all in on a young core. Uh, you got Dallas. Chet coming back. Chet coming back. Chet might be going to Dallas in this scenario. Jalen Williams or Jalen. Yeah, we'll probably they probably couldn't keep both those guys. But w- along with their like, they have like literally like twenty first. So they could just say, "Hey, Mark, we'll give you twenty first that they got for Westbrook and Paul George. <laughs> they really they did a number with those guys. Yeah. So that's just something interesting to keep an eye out for. Where would Luca go? Well, a team with a lot of picks, probably. Unless, I mean, he probably have like a wish list, but yeah, who would have thought OKC was going to have a better record at this point in the season than Dallas? They're currently in the play-in scenario. Dallas currently out. Also in that play-in tournament, you got the Lakers, Pelicans, and Timberwolves, and Clippers, right? No, the Clippers are currently number five. Oh, so, Clippers number five. Yeah, they're up a few spots. Gotcha. But yeah, that play-in, man, it's like they all have, what, 38 losses, I guess, uh, Mm -hmm. Minnesota 40, then OKC 41. But yeah, I didn't see Dallas being the ones bounced out of that. But I do, I have said for a few months now, probably at this point, that I think OKC was going to make it, and I think that they're going to be hard out in the play-in tournament. SGA, Jalen Williams, it's like they got some guys that really know how to play the, yeah, that dude's a beast. The torture chamber. <laughs> yeah, the dude's a beast. I think that if that first round or if that play-in matchup of the Lakers and OKC happens, I think that honestly, that's a crapshoot. I think either of those teams could win that game. I think the Lakers obviously have been on a run, but I like OKC. In a play-in tournament with LeBron James and Anthony Davis on one team, Ref ball would reign supreme. They're not going to put the thunder through over the Lakers in the best. Like league you one. said, though, no other team would be able to draw a foul. SGA is good at it, too. I get that, but it's just tough to no, stop Anthony you... Davis and LeBron's star power. You know, when, when they're playing like the Warriors or something in the play in, then you could be like, who could win? But. I hope I hope the league's not rigged like that, but it's yeah. hard to see it. Happening. I've seen I've seen a game this season several times. I think at least one, maybe two games where OKC has beaten the Lakers, and this was before the trades where everyone in the league gave the Lakers the exact <laughs> role players that they needed to be successful. Told you, but uh, I saw that coming. <laughs> I just I think it's going to be a close matchup. I agree with you that you know the refs will probably bail out LeBron and the ratings and all that sort of thing. The money generated that. The, and they've they've been playing really well. Anthony Davis has been playing really well. Although he still every third game rolls his ankle or something like that. So you never know that one of those That's guys could go down in between now and when that happens. But I, I just like OKC. I think they're going to put up a, a dog fight against whoever they uh, come against in that playing totally. tournament. Yeah, I totally agree. Honestly, I think you're probably right that if it was the Lakers and OKC, it might be a coin toss because it just depends on the game 
it's any given game, right? I mean, I think in general, the Lakers probably can outplay OKC. If it was a seven game series with, you know, the refs and everything, I'd totally be on board with the Lakers. But in any given game, OKC plays together. They really do. They they come out, they play hard, they play with a lot of energy. All it takes is Anthony Davis rolling his ankle at the wrong time, going out for a quarter, quarter and a half. <laughs> Day to Davis. It could completely change the complexion of the game. And it's not that unreasonable to think that he could go out halfway through the second. Yeah, and I would say it's fair to say neither of those teams have what you would call the best player in the league, like you know an MVP candidate. But you know they have great players. LeBron... LeBron's sexuals right now are uh, <laughs> screaming at their... Oh, they're in the comments. Their, their, yeah. LeBron has been eliminated from the MVP race. I'm sorry to say. He's the three, best player in the league. <laughs> it's a three-man race. We know who the three guys are. Giannis, Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic. Who you guys got? Let's just talk about that really quick. I am going to be honest with you. I've said it, I said it at the beginning of the season. Giannis Antetokounmpo is the best player in the NBA. And there could, there's an argument that could be made that maybe Embiid or Jokic has had a better season, potentially. But I don't agree with that argument. I think that Giannis is the MVP. I think he's the best player in the league, and I think he's the MVP. He's on the best team with the best record. You, you sound know. like Kendrick Perkins right now. <laughs> he said that same thing today. Sorry. Carry on. The racist MVP <laughs> voters. But uh, <laughs> uh, Giannis, he's like, he's like uh, what, third in, or what, fifth in scoring, something like that, you know, averaging a career high, 32 a game or something like that. He's top five rebounding. Great defender. He's like, can get a 35 point triple double anytime he seemingly wants to. And he's obviously saving something for the playoffs because we saw last year in the playoffs he was averaging like 40-point triple-doubles for most of the the run. And he's got a great supporting cast. They have done well when he's been out. He's maybe missed a few more games than some of those other you know, MVP candidates. But I just think that the record, the the championship odds, the you know the odds of them winning a championship this year and what they bring to the team as far as just being a supernova of basketball. I think Giannis is the my MVP this season. What Jokic does is pretty incredible. And on Denver, he has to do more than Giannis does. And he he does it very skillfully and it's impressive to watch. That said, best player on the best team, Giannis Antetokounmpo. He's my MVP as well. I think part of it is voter fatigue because yeah. I think that Giannis should win the MVP. You know, it's kind of like that, those LeBron era times where LeBron probably should have won like four in a row, five in a row. Now Giannis isn't even one of the two favorites, which I think he should be at least in the second spot. Um, I think Embiid will actually win the award. And because of voter fatigue. Like you said, they with Jokic people too. are getting tired of Jokic yeah, and yeah. Giannis. It's and, like... I think Embiid is probably worthy, and right now there's just had three a really guys. Good season. Have, yeah, have had three three good seasons. Um, I would personally choose Giannis as well. Clean sweep. Uh, I just think that the defense is just a game changer. Yeah. He he does everything except shoot threes, and I know Jokic does everything on offense, but he doesn't do everything on defense. Um, Embiid is kind of that complete guy, but you have times of the fatigue. You have times where he kind of gassed himself out. He ducked the game against Nikola Jokic in Denver. That was a bad look. look. He played a back-to-back right before that. He played the night after that. (laughs) Come on, man. If you want to win the MVP, you got to play in that game. That's kind of weird. Yeah, you got to play the best players, right? He played him in Philly just fine, but he couldn't show up to to Jokic's house. Like, come on. I mean, I I think that, like, if you play this game of taking away the player off the teams and, like, how much worse they get, the Embiid might be, like, win that race, you know? If you take Embiid off of Philadelphia, they're, like, they really are not very good. If you take Giannis off Milwaukee, maybe they're better than Philadelphia, that sort of game to play. But that's not the game I'm playing with in MVP. And I'm also not playing the best player on the best team. I don't necessarily think that that should just be the end-all, be-all of the MVP race. It should factor in. But I think just looking at all of that combined, kind of averaging all of those games out into one, I think that Giannis is the uh, MVP this year. We'll find out soon. I know that it'll be tight voting, and I know that Kendrick Perkins won't be voting for Jokic. <laughs> But, I wonder why. 
but it'll be fun to watch and it's been a good it's been a good year for the regular season yeah. awards races like a lot of the awards are tightly contested honestly this last week could determine it totally. there could be some shifting there depending on who plays well who plays who wins you know it should be an interesting end to the season as things shake out in the playoff race and the mvp race and then i'm on to the playoffs i'm excited for the playoffs this year i can't wait to watch them the blazers won't be in but i like watching this year especially it seems like the playoffs anybody could could win it honestly like. it's like a weight off my shoulders and the blazers get eliminated sometimes <laughs> i can just sit back and enjoy some good quality basketball without a dog in the fight our finals are the draft lottery <laughs> yeah We'll be uh, watching that with great in- with great interest. <laughs> Thanks for uh, tuning in, guys. We'll see you next time. See you. Bye.